This is an intro. Intro, intro, intro. Hustle and Float Shark with your boy, my boy, Matt Wolf and Joe Fit. Hey. Yo, yo. Hello. Welcome back to the Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast. Yo, yo. Hello. Yo, hello. Yo. We're back again. This time with another podcaster. Yes. That's not just you or me. Yeah. I love talking to podcasters. Podcasters are some of my favorite people to talk to. Mm, why is that? Because I love podcasting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I know that. But yeah, I guess podcasters like to talk. Mm-hmm. Can't shut them up. Uh, but they usually have good ideas. Yeah. In they a have, good way. You like, know what they have good ideas around? In a good way because like, you'll go for all, all day they long. They have good ideas around how to grow a podcast and how to monetize a podcast, which are two of my favorite topics to talk about. No, I would say they're pretty up there for us. Yeah, for sure. And that's exactly what we're talking about today with Tyrone Chum. And this dude is running a massive podcast over in Australia. He is one of the top um, iTunes, or I guess our Apple podcast, podcast now in the real estate space. Mm-hmm. It's called Property Investory. And um, this thing gets what's one point, I think it's 1.3 million downloads now since mm-hmm. 2017, which is, uh, that's quite the feat. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you got that many people listening to you, you're doing something right. You know how to grow and you probably know how to monetize a show pretty well at that yeah. point. Yeah. I think he's got the, I think you, you said this, but he's got the number one real estate podcast in Australia, 1.2 million downloads, 300, I think he said reviews. Um, over 300 episodes, too. Uh, 300 episodes, over 200 reviews. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's doing good stuff with podcasting and we're proud to be working with him. You'll hear some interactions that we have with him where we're, you know, kind of talking about ideas that we gave him and ideas that he gave us. So we're kind of working real closely with him. So we, we're all growing our podcast together mm-hmm. and you're going to hear a lot of those ideas. Um, But I think, uh, you know, one of the big takeaways from this episode is if you're not podcasting yet, we're going to really kind of hammer in on all of the exciting things that you're missing out on by not like paying attention to podcasting right now. Yeah. What's really cool, I think, uh, with Tyrone's uh, story Mm -hmm. is that he you'll hear literally from like day one what he kind of regretted back in the podcast (laughs) before starting his show. Um, his fears around podcasting, which is something we all have. And he's a very meth, um, he's a very systematic guy around everything he does. And he does a lot, but it's also very kind of automated or systemized. So uh, he explains exactly what his systems are and the different things he's done to not only uh, kind of launch his show, grow his show, but make money with his show as well. Mm-hmm. And yeah, throughout the conversation, Matt and I are like riffing back and forth of like, kind of like war strategies or war war stories around growing our show and making yeah. money because it's not the standard hey let's uh let's just make money with uh cpm sponsorships or getting our guests to share and that's the only way we promote shows because that's not <laughs> yeah i mean if you want to go behind the scenes of what we love about podcasting our insecurities around podcasting the things we don't like about podcasting we're going to take you behind the scenes on how we all what we feel about all of that stuff mm-hmm. but we also talk about how to get big name guests on your show some very very actionable tactics to get big name guests on your show we get very tactical about once you've had cool guests on your show how do you maintain that relationship how do you continue to follow up with these people that are now in your network because they've been on your show um, we, we go into all sorts of growth strategies, um, a few of them that Joe and I weren't even aware of before mm-hmm. going to this call that we're going to implement ourselves. <laughs> we go into a bunch of different monetization strategies, ways to make money with your podcast. A few of them Joe and I haven't experimented with, and we're excited to you know test some of them in our own business. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty all-encompassing episode all mm-hmm. about everything exciting in the podcasting world, everything we don't like about podcasting, mm-hmm. and all of the sort of tactics that run all of our shows (laughs) so basically yeah i I just counted it up here actually is i think he gave like 10 growth strategies Mm -hmm. yeah even if you're starting a show or if you have an existing podcast already and about seven or eight monetization strategies where you can actually make money with this thing that are not including the boring sponsorships that that you typically hear podcasters making money with because that's not how you typically make money (laughs) when you're starting off yeah and um yeah so you'll hear that i mean really at the end of the day this is a freaking master class in i would say growing and profiting with your show which actually met uh so Let's talk about this really fast because we have our Pod Hacker Masterclass, mm-hmm. which is um, part of 
it's it's kind of like the well it is the master class of everything that we do podcasting related and we have this cap method we, mm-hmm. we call it so the cap that's the creation is what the c a amplify which is you know grow your show and then profits is p which is monetize mm-hmm. so we basically have created this model of what we're doing but also what folks like tyrone are doing because he actually works with us mm-hmm. um but you'll see that we're very like peers mm-hmm. <laughs> you know we're, we're helping each other at the end of the day which is really cool with our master class is like that is a I would say that that's a group of folks who are taking podcasting seriously mm-hmm. even if they're just launching the show from day one they they're you know there's like a connection to a business or a profitable thing with that content that they're going to put out there which is what I really love with Tyrone is that mm-hmm. this ain't just some you know million downloaded podcast that has no end result the dude has like 10 different ways he's making money with his show and they're all super strategic and super, you know, out of the box thinking that just, yeah, that's where we, that's where we love like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just the creativeness of it all. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean the, the, the pod hacker masterclass, if you're interested in going through that, you know, shoot us a, a message info at evergreen profits. We'll get you all the details. We actually don't have a sales page or anything like that. For we that. might by the yeah. time this goes live. <laughs> that is true. There might be something, but if, uh, if it's not available, like in our show notes below, reach out and, uh, it is for sale. Um, you can, well, we'd you, love to have it. And, but you have to be serious. Like I think, like I was saying, and like doesn't matter if you want to be serious about any of that like that's the thing for you you know and those are the people we love working there with. was so much good stuff in this episode mm-hmm. that i wish i had some notes on it that would be very nice wish i had some better notes than what i took while listening to the episode Do you think they'll be supplied for this episode actually i think if you go to hustle and flow chart.com slash comp c-o-m-p mm-hmm. you can actually go snag the notes from this episode if you're quick if it's like within two weeks of this episode coming out okay what do you think um, why do I think that they're there? I think that they're there because I think you listening to this, um, are, you're listening to it right when it's coming out and you can go grab these notes for free. <laughs> and so that's why I think they're there. Oh, okay. <laughs> so hustle and flowchart.com slash comp. You can also, if you don't, if you're not near a computer, you can also shoot a text message. If you text the word comp, C O M P to the number three, eight, four, seven, zero, that is three, eight, four, four, seven, zero, zero comp is the word you're texting to three, eight, four, seven, zero. There it is. We'll send you the notes that way too. So mm-hmm. multiple ways to get these notes. Um, and they are there. I just checked. I verified. We do have extensive notes for this episode. So make sure to go there. Yeah. Unless you're late, then they're gone. Well, you could always, there's options for that, but still join because we'll give you that option. It's a pretty sweet option too. Yeah. Hustleandflowchart.com slash comp or text the word comp to 38470. Let's go have Let's a nice little chat with Tyrone Shum. Hey, hey, Tyrone. How you doing, man? Excellent, man. Yourself? We're doing amazing. It's a podcast day. This is like our favorite time of the uh you know our business is just like what we love you too i mean you're right in the thick of it all as yourself you know podcasting awesome yeah yeah it's been amazing and just to be able to hear and actually finally get to chat to you guys and and meet you kind of over sort of zoom uh to have this conversation i am so so grateful because you know i've I've been following your podcast and listening to everything that you guys say and all the interviews you've done and i'm like wow (laughs) i just want to do what you guys are doing all the time (laughs) it's just so funny you're saying that and you're like you're the dude over there that has what over a million downloads um (laughs) probably like way more now and uh what one of the top podcasts in australia right there with our buddy james shramko (laughs) thank you so so, uh good work yourself man i mean that's like that's off to you yeah. yeah, I mean, we're, we're aspiring to do with our podcast what you've done with your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's awesome, man. We'll just swap hats now. Yeah. <laughs> we all got something to learn from each other, so it's, all, it's perfect. Oh, man. Love it. Yeah, well, let's, uh, yeah, yeah, and you're, you know, we're working together and, and um, you know, you're working with us on the podcast, on our pod hacker, podcast accelerator side of things. We, we can't keep track of all the names that we're calling this thing. Uh, <laughs> sorry for Gosh, amazing. gosh, just stick with one name. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to make it better. <laughs> no, so, um, yeah, I mean, just like through our relationship there, the fact, the way that you think and approach podcasting, I think is so interesting and unique and the way you apply it to business specifically i think is very cool it's very fascinating and i think that's the like in in the world of podcasting when people are starting it out uh, that typically the question is how do i make money with this thing 
and mm. you're over here doing it in very strategic ways that are different from most uh, ways I've heard. And um, I think that's what really allows you to stand out. Obviously, you've grown the show really big, too. So that's a really big factor of it all. Um, so I'd love to cover a lot of that on this show. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And I, I have to say, a majority, and I will give you guys full credit for this, because when I did actually sign up and start working with you guys, a lot of things have really, the, the techniques, the strategies have changed my mindset on the way to approach it. Because initially, when I first started podcasting, the whole idea for me was just to try and get sponsorship in, you know, get the big banks mm -hmm. on, get all the big, uh, you know, telecom communication companies because they actually tap in their investors and so forth. And I thought that would probably be the way because I was initially inspired by Johnny Lee Dumas's podcast where, you know, he was getting like a million downloads a month. And I thought, great, you know, let's have a crack at that and see if we can do something like that. Mm -hmm. And when I first started doing that, it was, it was really, really, you know, challenging when I first started because there was just starting from zero to, to bring up even just a hundred listeners to the show <laughs> was yeah. a real, real, um, yeah, just hard grind. And I guess over that period of time, since learning so many new different ta tactics and strategies from what you guys have been putting out, man, it, it just changes the mindset. You don't have to actually do so hard to actually try and bring your numbers up. The main thing is, is now being very strategic with putting those partners in place and happy to share, you know, those kind of strategies that I've been applying and how it's worked for us. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, be before we do, let's let's talk a little bit about about your your podcast. What's the concept behind it? You know, what what kind of things do you talk about? Just kind of let, let's um, kind of give the audience a little bit of an overview of of the, the, the podcast that we'll be talking about for the next you know, forty five minutes or so. <laughs> the show and the business, like uh, kind of both of them. Yeah, yeah, hand you know. in hand. Sure, sure. So the podcast initially was started off for selfish reasons. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest with you guys with that because you Same know initially here. I actually just wanted to to just tap on the guys' shoulders, these property experts, the investment gurus who we hear all around the media across Australia. And I thought, gosh, you know, how can I actually get access to these without necessarily have to attend their seminars and you know buy all their equipment and and all their tools and resources and courses and stuff like that. And what was kind of like that turning point for me was I was listening to a number of podcasts and also going back in like 2016 when one of my friends was also being featured in one of the most prop, uh, very, very popular Australian uh, property magazine, investor magazines out there. And when I saw him featured in there, I thought, holy moly, how did he get there? Because he's mm -hmm. probably maybe about three or four years younger than me and he's accumulated in such a short period of time, like within maybe about a space of a year, he had bought six properties. And I'm like, mm. how'd you do it? And then a few years later, he told me he's got 20 properties. I'm like, come on, you got to tell me the secret behind it. <laughs> and he said, well, some of them have been because he's been able to tap into amazing coaches and experts and, and the resources that they provide out there. And he's just basically implement everything that they've been talking about. So, that kind of got me started on that journey to start creating this because I was following a lot of the great successful podcasts out there. And they were talking about the how to invest into property, where to buy and so forth. But the biggest issue that I found, and, and this is something that I kind of had stuck in myself, was like, what's, what's the why behind it? What are, these, what are these people trying to share with us? I want to hear about their background story because it's very easy to, okay, hear about a guy earning, you know, a million dollars just from investing into property and then accumulate 20 properties. And that, that's, that's inspiring in itself. But the thing is, is why? Why is he doing all that? And a lot of times when I was hearing this podcast, it was just very much the specific information about where to go and invest, um, you know, look at the, the strategies that you can actually do to buy this particular property, do like a renovation, uh, then you, you, you pull your equity out and, you know, buy another property and blah, blah, blah. Long story short, it was like that kind of aha moment and it, it took me almost about a year to actually want to do something like this because I had it in the back of my mind, I was trying to work every day listening to the same podcast and it just struck me and I said, why is no one doing it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said to myself, gosh, do I, have the, do I have the capacity to actually do something like this? And it took me pretty much a year before I actually jumped in and decided, all right, I'm going to get out there and, and start speaking with all these experts and you know, perhaps just learning so much from them, having their guidance under, under their wings and you know, learning from them and then taking that and then sharing it with the world. And it, it just went from you know, that big change of the aha moment to get started. And I think also too, it was because I was involved with um, James Franco's super fast business mastermind group there. Mm -hmm. And being part of that community, they were constantly talking about creating membership site programs and also podcasting was one of the other things. 
it wasn't very, very much in detail in terms of how they did podcasting and so forth, but the idea of actually creating a residual income or recurring income through membership sites was something that really resonated with me. Mm-hmm. And I thought, how could I actually take the two of these, whether it be through po- property or through the podcast or in that, and turn that into some kind of membership model where I could actually attract clients in and you know offer them a, a great service, but also receive a recurring income. And that's kind of where that kind of started and that's how this whole business turned into a podcast. And basically in that first year, I went from zero to 40,000 downloads and applying a lot of the tactics and strategies that you guys have talked about and I've learned from a lot of different podcasts out there and just actioning those, you know, some worked, some didn't. And through that kind of learning experience, it turned from zero to 40,000 downloads a month to over now 1.2 to 1.3 million downloads since I started about two years ago. Jeez, so that's the kind yeah. of story that um, <laughs> I think the part that I, I like the most about like what you were just saying there is that you approached it with a very smart monetization model really from the beginning where it ties to your business with the membership site like you were saying. You got that from James and and doing that. I think a lot of folks don't approach podcasting in that way, you know, from like day one. Yeah, and I totally agree. Like a lot of us out there initially started off just to, I guess, want to create a, a, a podcast that was interesting and also share the knowledge because I guess I wanted to fill that gap, not necessarily just only for myself, but also for the listeners because when I spoke to a lot of listeners out there, they said exactly the same thing. The reason why Property Investory Podcast stands out is because it tells a story. It's not like any other podcast out there where you actually delve into the background about where they grew up all the way through to how they got started in property. And that kind of paints a picture which is very, very important because I think people resonate and remember stories a lot more than say a how-to specific tactic and trick. And I guess that's probably what I've learned over this journey and, and want to impart to people who actually want to podcast is make sure that whenever you are looking at doing a podcast to tell a story in between and because that's what people will remember. Like this is what I love about the Hustle and Flow Chart podcast is because when you actually invite a guest on, you actually delve into their backstory and find out, you know, how they got started even way before they go into say mm-hmm. marketing or digital things or even, you know, SEO and so forth because that backstory paints a picture of who they really are mm-hmm. and it gives you that inspiration because they can start from nothing to build up to multi-billion dollar business. And that's the exciting part behind it. Then people go, okay, I want to listen to this guy more because he's done that, but also I want to hear his strategies. And that's how we kind of structured the whole podcast to ensure that the first half of the um, podcast where we start the episode is to actually just spend a lot of time building up their story, finding out their childhood, what they did for work, where they went to you know, get married, all those kind of interesting things because it just kind of paints that story. Then we jump into finding out about, okay, where was their, their first investment property and we jump into how they built their portfolio and so forth. Yeah, no, I, I think I think it's an important aspect because your listeners need to relate with the person you're bringing on. If you bring somebody on who's had a ton of success and you just talk to them about how they got that success and you just talk tactics, 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 then your listeners are, you know, this is just sort of my own theories, but your listener is going to listen to that show and they're going to feel like, well, they can do it, but I could never do that. Where if you get that whole story and you kind of get the beginnings of it, then you, you relate to the person who's on the episode and you start to understand that, you know, they've been in similar positions that the listeners are probably in right now, but they, you know, employed these tactics to get out of that situation. Mm-hmm. And so I think, I think you've, you've, for a podcast to be successful, I think the people on the podcast have to be relatable. Yeah, totally, totally. And that, that's the interesting thing about it is that I guess that's the reason why you guys ask about that story is because you think, you know, if this guy has started from nothing who has had another podcast and that's, I'm referring to myself, not to give myself a bit of a boost or anything, but I started from nothing. Honestly, it's not like I, I had a, a thousand followers already on my podcast. I started literally from zero from the day I started, but I implemented the strategies that I was taught. And that's the thing. It's just all about taking action and applying the things that you learn because you can have all that knowledge in your head, which I did for the whole year. <laughs> and I was still like, why did I not start this earlier? And, you know, not do any action. But then, you know, you got to sort of find that, that emotional kick and drive inside of you that makes that big change. And I think at that point in time, I still remember very clearly, it was actually 2016 Christmas that I went, okay, I really, really have to start this. And that's when I just went bang. I went and started and just started doing like, I think I did like 20 or 30 interviews in that first month just to try to get the podcast up and running. 
And once you get in that flow, gosh, you just don't want to stop. <laughs> yeah. That's what happened the whole time. <laughs> it does get pretty addicting after a while, especially the new connections and like friends you're making along the way. Then everybody just helps you out because they're sharing things around, giving you new ideas. Um, well, really quick, like just to delve into your backstory a little bit. I know we've been talking about, you know, kind of bouncing around. Um, we're kind of like playing with a kind of a newer structure with the the story arc of, of the beginning of these shows. But uh, where would you where would you say like maybe some a couple of points that you felt looking back in time that you're like, man, I really wish I did this differently or maybe I did this thing sooner. I'm sure the podcast falls in that. But in relation with your business and the podcast as a whole. Or something that you would have done, you know, just like now in retrospect, you're just like, okay, yep, I was yeah. done. <laughs> what, what do you wish you knew back then that you know now? Uh, yeah, that's a really, really good question. I, I wish I knew, and, and coming from both sides, from both the business side and the property side, I wish I knew more experts that, I, that actually gave me support and encouragement because I think that's where it really drove me because I kept shying away from talking to these experts as per se, but they're just, you know, like everyday people with, with me, like you and me, the only difference mm -hmm. is that they've spent a lot of time crafting their, their skill, their, their um, expertise and, and just building up that knowledge base. And if I had just started two or three years earlier than with them alongside, I, I think, you know, things in perspective, I would have just been a lot further than I am now. Not saying that I haven't, you know, t t taken a great leap from where I started, but I think that's the thing. I should have actually just reached out to them much earlier. And I think there's fear. Fear was probably the biggest thing that held me back for that period of time because I, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I don't know if it was going to work. I don't know if they're going to just say no. And and when you get that first no, that rejection, you think, oh, you know, this guy probably doesn't want to talk to me because I'm a nobody. Mm -hmm. But once you actually get those few who you reach out in the right way and and get them to come onto the podcast and share their story. And then you say, hey, look, you know, so-and-so from X, Y, and Z have come onto the podcast recently and you just piggyback off them. The success just continues to ride. And that's that's how I've done it. And that's what I did initially when I first started because I learned that, you know, if you just name drop a few people that they know in the industry, straight away it brings up your, um, I guess, level of confidence for them to know that you're not just a nobody out there because a lot of people just start these podcasts and try and reach out to all the top experts in no matter what niche they are. And a lot of times, these people just don't have the time to share because you've got a small audience or even close to zero, <laughs> they probably don't want to spend their time for that hour to be interviewed and then shared out to almost no one. So, I think the challenge that everyone and myself faced was that fear factor, you know, and, and I, I have to admit, it's it's something that I think just naturally everyone goes through that phase. Mm -hmm. But if you can overcome that and then just start taking action, that that action step that you take will eliminate a lot of the fear. You still have it in the back of your mind subconsciously, but at the same time, um, the more action you take, the less it becomes scary to do. That's that's good. Yeah, it's it's like a, the whole momentum concept. It's like once you have momentum and you're just putting stuff into action, you kind of like stop the overthinking of stuff, yeah. and and momentum just breeds more momentum. Well, <laughs> and even when it comes to guests too, it's like once you've had that sort of higher profile guest on, it's easier to get more higher profile guests, and then once you've had a handful of higher profile guests on, it's even easier to get more higher. Mm -hmm. And you know, it just it, it gets easier and easier to get people yes. on and to to chase people up and to to get the right connections to the people you want to know. In fact, that's one of the reasons I love podcasting so much is that podcasting is like a shortcut to networking with people. Totally, totally. It is one of the best and fastest form. And eventually they start coming out to you because they start seeing that your podcast is ranked number one or in the top five or top 10 of iTunes and so forth. And that's what's been happening. Like some of the people that I really, really wanted on my dream list, they just started reaching out to me and like, oh, great, that <laughs> solved my problem there. <laughs> right? Yeah, no, that's exactly what happens. It's this, you're building a platform online and you, you kind of don't realize that you're actually getting a lot of attention in doing this. Even if you're not on the charts, you don't even need to be on this charts, but if you are, I mean, it's all the better. Yeah. But you know, just the sheer amount of just the viral social sharing within one person's network and you know they're connected to this other network and then it just gets kind of passed around and if you're consistent anything with consistency it just gets bigger and bigger so it's it, it, podcast it kind of forces you to be consistent like you are and we are too at like two shows a week mm -hmm. 
Yep, yep, totally agree. And, and that's the beautiful thing about it right now. Like it's getting to that point that it is starting to tip over a little bit more that, you know, initially when we first started a few years ago, it was just the brink of podcasting starting to take off. But now since like, for example, it, like Gimlet got purchased out by Spotify not long ago and I've been following Alex Bloomberg as well for mm -hmm. his podcast and startup, a lot of people now are jumping on and I've noticed like big companies like in Australia, we've got some big development companies like Fraser's Property and Meriton and Metricon and all those ones and they're all starting to come on with their own podcasts. Same mm -hmm. thing with the banks. Banks are actually creating uh, joint ventures between each one. I think it was Westpac and GE formed a joint venture podcast to come on and create that amazing show. Mm -hmm. So, they're seeing the value of how it's tapping in and, and for them, instead of actually spending money on pr probably getting onto the radio, which I, I know that they still do, but like they see that having their own podcast, their own followings, they get to be able to communicate directly with their audience instead of having to go through another medium, which is very, very hard to measure at this point in time, both like TV right. and yeah. radio. So, this seems like an amazing platform and now that we're at such a great stage in it at this, at this time, there's so much more potential for the future. So, that's why I'm really, really excited about podcasting as well. Yeah. I mean, even in the TV and film industry, they're leveraging podcasts. We've heard this from multiple different sources now that when, you know, somebody has an idea for a TV show or a movie and they bring it to like the head of a studio to make the movie, pretty much the, the way things work nowadays, the studio head's going to say, go make a, a serial episodic or no serial <laughs> podcast around that storyline. Mm -hmm. If the podcast does well, then we'll you know, we'll commission it for an actual TV show or a movie. So a lot of the entertainment industry is actually testing content ideas with podcasts now because the barrier to entry is so much lower. And then the stuff that does work, they're going and making TV shows and movies out of. I mean, even, you know, you mentioned Alex Bloomberg. There was literally a TV show made out of that guy's story. It was called Alex Inc. Um, yeah, yeah, I heard about that. I still haven't seen it yet because I've heard that people were saying that that particular TV show that they created um, didn't really, I guess, mimic what had happened on his actual podcast itself. The podcast was a lot more interesting from the reviews I heard. I, yeah. I don't know about you, but <laughs> it is. The, the TV show is not great, and I think it got canceled. So that's saying something. <laughs> but um, you know, uh, the, the the fact that it got canceled is neither here nor there. But it's just it's just sort of like evidence that this stuff is really on the rise. Yeah, totally, totally. You know, let, let's hope to see Hustle and Flow China TV show in the, in the near future. <laughs> hey, man, we got plans to do some video stuff and get a little bit more bingeable with our content. So. Oh, yeah. That is that is sort of the next rabbit hole that we've really been going down and studying is how do you make content completely bingeable so people just want to keep going to the next one and the next one and the next one. Yeah. I mean, if you so. think about it, that's, that's the trend where everything's going. And you, there are actually podcasts and a lot of big companies using content in creative ways. And podcast is just part of it. But you know, if you're if you're creating visuals around all this, it could be repurposed into podcasts and all these other assets that are super consumable everywhere. So it's exciting. Totally, totally. <laughs> it's exciting. And, and that's what I love about what you guys talk about because one of the strategies that I've taken away from what you've been teaching us is the repurposing and distribution strategy. Mm -hmm. And that's worked exceptionally well for for my business because thing is, is before I used to just rely heavily just on iTunes to be able to get the the word out and also rely on the guests to be able to post it out to their networks on Facebook and all the social media channels. But now that we've actually been repurposing and, and distributing three different mediums from video, audio and text and so forth across all the different platforms that you recommend and that's what you guys do as well, it, it, it just has brought in so much more breadth to our business because we're not just relying on one channel, we've actually got multi channels now to be able to distribute the content and I think people are consuming in so many different ways like I know that people coming through from Spotify now which mm -hmm. I never used to have and I've yep. known that people are actually reading our PDS because it's now out there on SlideShare and all these other channels <laughs> and furthermore, you know, the videos are all over Facebook and so forth. So. The, these repurposing concepts is, is, is a very simple thing and it took me a while to sort of just understand, okay, how am I going to do this because it's not just something you're just going to implement overnight. It, it does take time to actually put these systems and processes in place. But with your guidance yeah. and your help, I've been able to implement these and hire more staff to be able to help me do it because this is the stuff that will actually help us uh, build up the brand even further across the web and you know, it's working phenomenally really, really well for us as well too.
That's awesome. Yeah. And that's, thank you for saying that. I think that's really cool. And um, we're actually even upping our repurpose game a little bit further. So <laughs> you'll hear more about that as well. Um, yeah, because that's, that's the biggest thing is it, it, it almost like killed Matt and I. We're like, man, we're going to put all this energy into this hour long interview, which we're going to love and we're going to have a great conversation, but it's only going to be as a podcast. It's like, why? No, this thing needs to be seen everywhere. And, you know, like we're now experimenting a lot with like LinkedIn and we're seeing so many people connecting on there and that's B2B. It's perfect for us. It'd be perfect for you as well. I'm sure you're already on there, but um, (laughs) yeah, there's there's just so many good organic ways to get growth of a show. And it's not like there's really a magic bullet unfortunately it's just consistency well i think i think one of my biggest fr- fr- i mean i have a lot of frustration with podcasting i think that <laughs> the tracking is in the you know ancient times still and i and discoverability is still fairly difficult but one of my other biggest issues with podcasting is that f- people seem to devalue episodes with time so like episodes mm. that we recorded a year ago kind of don't get any love anymore and that just bugs the heck out of me because the content we were creating two years ago three years ago on this show is still just as valuable today as it was then and i feel like bringing the repurposing stuff into the mix and highlighting clips and uh you know we even have our short show which is like a, a clip show from older episodes and things like that it helps us kind of continually bring good content to the forefront that a lot of people might discard just because of the age of it. Totally. And, and that's been the biggest challenge I face now. I mean, like I've got over 350 plus episodes and hmm. iTunes has a limit of like 300 that they display on iTunes. And I get to that point where I go, okay, all the first few that I've recorded, probably the first batch of 100 because I've had so many great experts and well-known media gurus have talked about property on the show, they're, they're the ones that I want to bring back to the front. So, I'm, I'm actually doing very, very similar to actually what you guys are doing is basically taking the current content that's existing there and then just repurposing it like, like in the sense that when I say repurposing for us is that we actually change the background music to update it a little bit more to today's you know new format that we've got changing some of the way that things are scripted, turning in the story form, etc. So, I've, I, we actually go into the edits of it, but then I would chop those up into little snippets and then put them out as mini trailers for like maybe a two-minute trailer or 10-second snippet that goes onto YouTube or whatever it is. So, I'm, I'm pretty much doing very, very much what you guys have been teaching as well and, and trying to apply that. It just takes a, a fair amount of time because the system to actually get that in place um, is... Yeah. is, is ongoing it's it's an in progress kind of thing but it just goes to show how big the machine can become because no way in the world would i have ever thought that i would have had that many podcasts within a two-year period because (laughs) it just it just kept going and now now instead of actually going where am i finding this content it's like i've got too much content (laughs) i've got to figure (laughs) out how am i going to get that content out to the right people and and find the best content so i think that that's what i'm trying to do and work out right now I've been listening to other podcasts such as like um, how I built this with Guy Ross and NPR and I'm noticing what they do is they just repurpose or republish the old content two years ago and say, hey, you know, this was two years ago. This is an amazing story. Please, you know, if you guys haven't heard of it, listen to it again. And, and that's what, you know, we can do as, as podcasters to be able to get more traction because if you've already got a following getting like, you know, 6,000, 8,000 downloads per episode, the, you know, the people who may have just started recently listening to your show may have not even jumped back two, three, four years ago when you've actually created those ones and then to bring them back to the top doesn't, you know, it, it makes all your content shine even more because your old content is just as valuable and, and spot true. on what you guys have said, you know, it's just try and bring that back up to the forefront of people's minds. Yeah, no, I think that's that's really smart. That's something we haven't really done to, um, too much is pull old episodes. I, I We've done it a little bit, you know, like I, I had some higher profile names that I interviewed five, six years ago, and I almost did it for like egotistical reasons of like, I want to <laughs> see this person's name in our feed. So I'd like bring some of that older content up. But um, that's really, really smart to kind of make, you, you know, do it systematically and more methodically than that. Well, it's smart. Yeah. And there's a lot of ways you 
you can approach that is uh, not only just re-release the episode or maybe even snippets and combine it into like a, a themed episode mm-hmm. from stuff from the archives. You can even bring in that guest again. We do a lot of repeating guests, the yeah. people that are most popular. So we're definitely going to bring them back. I'm going and recording that, that those guys that uh, were rec- um, I'm recording a podcast with them in person. They're from LA. And um, anyway, uh, they have like the, a really cool thing where they like every like eighth episode or something is like a roundup episode where it'll be, for example, uh, I, I don't know examples for their show, but an example with our show would have been like, here's the 10 best YouTube traffic strategies we've gotten from our show. And then they would pull little like five minute clips from 10 different shows of somebody giving a YouTube tip. And then they'd sort of make this repurposed roundup episode of clips from people talking about YouTube on past episodes. That's awesome. And, and that's, that's kind of where I'm actually thinking of 2020 to change up my podcast to do that because I want to sort of become more like a startup podcast where I'm starting to actually put together a story and a theme instead because at the moment it's mostly interviews where we do edit and then put into a specific format and a story kind of format. But what we've been doing, because as I said, we've got so much content that's buried underneath a few hundred episodes ago. Like I'll probably pick one topic, for example, I'm actually working on one right now for probably January and for listeners out there who haven't uh, heard my podcast or have been following me and thinking, okay, he's been doing stories, probably mm-hmm. this, this one is kind of a little sneak peek is I'm planning to probably do a topic on property development for the listeners out there and pulling out all the great property developers out there and then just basically, not necessarily a roundup but just telling a story um, from a question that people ask and one of the questions that people always ask is, how do these property developers make so much money? You know, they're, they're not making just, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. They're making millions and millions of dollars just from a development. And that question always com- comes up and, pop, uh, you know, is always a very, very popular question as well. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's just phenomenal to be able to do something like that. And I think as time progresses, you know, I want to try and make this podcast to be a, a very high production quality podcast, which people want to, you know, listen to as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you're definitely doing it right. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to. Uh, so, what are some other growth strategies that you've found? So, repurposing is huge, and um, of course, now you have a lot of good momentum, and you know, you do a handful of other things. It looks like, but guide us through maybe a couple of the things that we can give listeners here, thinking about starting a show from scratch, or also what it would have been your per, like your personal biggest like what 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 have been the biggest wins for you with growth? Has there been like a handful of things that you've seen have been the most effective? Yeah, totally. So, I'm, I'm going to take a step back then. We'll go back to when I first started because a lot of those strategies that I applied back then still work today. It's just a matter of how you want to approach it and then take it on. So, initially when I first started, the, to actually get the podcast onto iTunes, you probably don't want to just put out maybe one, you know, one podcast initially. You want to put out a number. So, I think when I first started, I had six podcasts lined up. So, that way I had six guests who were ready to promote and, and I, I got to admit, you know, everyone says that you just got to try and get your guests to promote your podcast, promote their story and so forth and they usually would do that but it's not as easy as it sounds because <laughs> then that first, first launch and, and try and making a launch, those six people, I probably only got maybe three, three out of the six that committed to actually promote the podcast out to their list and even then it was very, very slow trickles in, you know, it wasn't yeah. like, you know, 100,000 people coming in listening to the podcast, it was maybe like 10, 15 or so. So, you know, this is the reality of it and I, I don't want to sugarcoat anything because, you know, for anyone starting out, you've you got to give it some time and it, it, it t- took me at least about six to nine months to actually start to see this exponential growth that, that it brought from zero to 40,000 a month downloads. But the, the challenge is, is staying in that frame set that you know, okay, you got to stick it through. You can't just give up by saying, okay, you've only got maybe 10, 15 people listening. So, the, the, the thing I've learned is that you've got to release consistently. That's, that's the key point about actually doing podcasting because once your listeners start getting hooked on, they expect that you will release at a certain time. So, for me, mine's a pretty solid schedule where we release at least minimum two episodes a week. So, either on a Wednesday and Friday, we have those two spots filled up with guests. Um, episodes being released and then on Monday we have an actual separate guest like a Q&A session or a topical kind of um, yeah I guess story that we bring in from specific experts that we bring back onto the podcast which I'll, I'll share with you the reason behind that later on because that's a sort of a monetization method behind that one. So, essentially we have like three episodes that go out but taking a step back to where I started from that initial first zero to six months or so, it was pretty much 
every time I had a guest that was posted out there, I'd reach out back to them via email and let them know that their guest was, was pretty much out there and please, you know, feel free to share it out there. And then we did the usual posting out to Facebook. I also reached out via a few people and tried to get them onto the email list and so forth. And even back then, I had absolutely no one on my email list. There's like zero subscribers when I first started. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you had to get all the website set up and all the back end stuff like using an email autoresponder and all that kind of stuff, which took a little bit of time, but I eventually got there. And as time kind of progressed, when you start seeing smaller guests that come on, even though they've got like... Um, smaller amounts of subscribers on there. So, they may have like 2,000 and 3,000 people on the list compared to someone who I know some experts like I have 100,000 people on the list. Those ones seem to have a lot more engaged audience that come through. Mm -hmm. So, when I actually found a few of those and I had maybe about 10, 15 of those kind of smaller property investors who were deemed as experts in the market but had a much smaller list, their lists were very, very engaged. And as soon as they posted on Facebook or posted it out to their list, I started seeing those things just ramp up uh, traffic to the, the, the show as well. So, that was probably the, the biggest thing I did initially up front was to keep it consistent, send it out to the guests as soon as the posts were released and to encourage and ask them if they wouldn't mind sharing it with their list. Nine times out of ten, they'll say it's not, not a problem. It's just whether or not they get around to it. That's the issue because yeah. <laughs> um, they'll say yes but, you know, you don't see it happening maybe for a week or two or maybe they even forget. That's the thing, they get busy. So, I totally understand that and that's the way I had to make a follow-up and just not to be too pushy or anything, maybe two or three weeks later to say, hey, how's things going? Did you have a, a, a great, you know, um, response from your podcast and also too, I, I strategically set it up this way. Normally, when I interview the podcast guests onto the show, it's an hour-long interview and what I do is I chop it up into two parts as well too. So, first part I usually released that first week and then about three or four weeks later, I released their second part. So, therefore, I've got a three or four-week gap and therefore, I can reach out to them twice as well. So, that's how I was able to continue to bring them back in because if you say something the first time, say, hey, your part one's gone out, great, and they don't do anything, then I've still got a potential chance to reach out to them the second time around and usually by that time around, they're like, okay, they've had people actually reach out to them and say, hey, I've heard about your story. Then they go, oh, okay, it's actually working. Let me promote it out to my list. So, <laughs> yeah. it kind of, it kind of like became sort of like that. Them. Yeah. yeah, I'm actually impressed that you're you're getting people to actually email their list. It seems like, you know, we reach out to people and we, we you know we ask them to email their list and share it however they can. And it seems like the the norm is for them to make a post on Facebook and Twitter and call it a day. So I'm actually pretty impressed that you're getting people to actually mail about your episodes. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, I have to say it's a different market too. That you have to remember, property investors are a little bit slower in terms of at technology side of things. Like right. especially <laughs> in this market, a lot of them are very old school. You're, you're talking to people who are like 50, 60 plus years old who've been in the game for 20, 30 years and, you know, th they've had some guy like in their, in their team or in their office helping them just set up an email list that sends out regular emails on their behalf. So, they don't really go too much on those kind of things but it's the, usually the younger generation that I found, the people who've got, you know, young generation between 20 and, and sort of 35 years old-ish um, in that kind of range, they're the ones who usually use social media a lot. And, you know, I've had stories from both ends of the spectrum and they, they really do work in different ways. So, it's been interesting to see the different ways go about it. And it makes sense too. You know, it makes sense with going after um, the smaller markets or the smaller lists, you know, and, and this is like the case with smaller podcasts is typically they're the more loyal people who are listening and the ones that will take action. Same with an email list, you know, it's like ours, we prune our list like crazy. And, um, yeah, so a lot of folks, if you could target those when starting off, I think that's a great idea. And then incentivizing, as you're actually giving me an idea now, it's like you can incentivize people in many ways to get them to email their list. Mm -hmm. And that could be potentially one of the better, you know, growth levers in the early days. And yeah, I, I think I think in our niche specifically, I think you probably get people being a little more protective about their lists. Yeah, um, marketing niches and yeah. Yeah, because, you know, we talk to a lot of entrepreneurs and marketers and, you know, we do we have had people on here with hundreds of thousands, even millions on their lists. And I, I think a lot of people in our niche at least seem to be much more protective about what they email, but they're pretty open to, to sharing on social media and talking about it in that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. And and this is the thing, you, you just raised a really good point and it just reminded me, I was going to share this other thing that I used to do as well too, which I, I do still do from time to time. 
But um, <laughs> I usually ask the guests in the past who I've known have written books or so if they wouldn't mind actually sending a few free copies away to give away, you know, to mm. incentivize the listeners to subscribe and to download and to reach out to them. And a lot of them have sent me a lot of books. So I've still got a lot of them actually sitting on the shelf, but I've given <laughs> away a lot of them as well at the same time. So, oh, yeah, it's, it's been a, a, a like win-win that. situation because at the same time, their, their book, most people have either been wanting to buy it or just don't have, have the resource to be able to get it. And if you can give it away for people who really, really do genuinely want it, then it, it provides like a little incentive to get them also to, to whether or not leave a review, to subscribe to your list, to download whatever it is, or, or just even reaching out to the guest and say, hey, you know, I heard about you and they said, look, send me a book for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So, that strategy has been working. So, if you can ask guests who have books they've written, they want to give them away for free, it's, you know, free publicity for them for the cost of their book and it's definitely much, much cheaper and a lot more um, leverageable for them than to actually spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on, on a pay campaign. So, that's been a really, really powerful strategy in, in my opinion as well too. So, just to clarify, when, when you ask somebody to bring, to come on the show, you ask them if they have a book they want to give away and you, you ask for a few copies and then you sort of like raffle them off or, you know, what, what what's the sort of tactic there? Yeah, so, like, I'll give you one example. One of the guys were actually doing a, a book a, a book launch recently and he was saying to me, you know, look, I've got about 10 books I'd be happy to send across to you to give away. Would you like to do that? And I said, yeah, of course, I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> so, why not? So, he sent me a whole bunch of them and I said, look, um, you're okay if I just said to my listeners, if anyone who wants to get a book, just leave a review for us and um, yeah, we'll send a copy out. And I said, yeah, for sure, just get it out to them as many people as you can and, and promote it and so forth. So, things like that do work in, in many ways um, and that's, that's the way I've really done it. I mean, you, you mentioned raffling off there, yeah, that could also work as well. So, there's so many different strategies but the way I've mm -hmm. done it mostly is just to ask, like give them a call to action say, hey, if you like X, Y and Z's um, story and they've got a free book that they're giving away right now, usually $30, which you can pick up from the bookstore or we can give it away if you leave a review for me on you know, X, Y and Z link and that, that works wonders. I like that and this gave me a con an idea to uh, promote previous episodes as well as you can go back now. I, mean, I was like writing this down as you were talking, mm -hmm. but it's like, yeah, we've interviewed so many freaking authors and they're always willing to send us books for mm -hmm. us to check out prior to the episode. I'm sure you get that too, uh, mm -hmm. but you can go back in time now and you know maybe create like almost a little mini contest. It's like, hey, we got 10 books, free books from this person run a Facebook campaign or a little mini contest that says, hey, go, you know, rate and review first 10 or maybe 10 at random within this period of time, get free books on us or yeah. on the author. But it's just a way to perpetually have, you know, something new going. Yeah. Well, I mean, quite honestly, the podcasting is kind of the new press junket, right? When people mm -hmm. release a new book, instead of going around and trying to be on all the, I mean, a lot of people still go on like morning shows and stuff like that, but it's now just part of the plan. You go on all these podcasts too. Like look at when, when Tony Robbins released his last book about finances and stuff, he was on every freaking podcast you can find everybody's same with Gary Vaynerchuk, same with Tim Ferriss, all of those guys, like that's the new book junk it is you release a book and you go on a crap ton of podcasts and tell people about the book yep yeah. yep i'm nodding my head exactly that's what happened that's why i was like <laughs> oh great you know these guys who i've been trying to reach out to for months decided to come on my podcast because they said i've got a book to promote and that's how i got them on so i was like wow exactly. <laughs> just gotta wait wait for them to write a book then <laughs> yeah. no i mean that it's is true. really a trick in itself around getting bigger name guests on is wait until they have a book or something that they really are trying to get out into the world and just time the interview for when they've got something that you can help them promote another strategy is i mean you could always obviously buy the en enough number of books sometimes the bigger names want you to buy a certain number of quantity books to get them on, but also speaker fees. Everyone has a speaker fee and it's easy for them to, you know, if you pay them a certain amount, we haven't actually had to do this, but I know it's a strategy out there. Or you can donate to a, uh, a cause that they back or charity or nonprofit or something like that. And, you know, just little things like that, you're giving value and you could break through just like, hey, can you be on my podcast? But it's like, <laughs> you know, even if you're a smaller show and you're doing cool and you're like offering to pay them in a certain way, then more likely than not, you're at least you're going to get a response. Well, I mean, quite honestly, 
people of a certain level, once you've reached like a certain status in your industry, they don't really need your podcast anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. Like there's like Richard Branson does not need our podcast to help with his marketing or to get the word out on something. Elon Musk doesn't need to come on our podcast to help spread the word about something. But if you can figure out some other way to provide them with a huge benefit, you're much more likely to get people like that on the show. You know, going back to what Joe just said about offering to support a charity. We have a really, really good friend who, who got in touch with Richard Branson and got to go spend a day with him because she went and supported his charity. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Roland Frazier got Richard Branson to come speak at Traffic and Conversion Summit by essentially investing money towards Richard Branson's charity. So if you can sort of um, stop thinking about like, hey, come on my show because it's going to help you start thinking about other ways outside of the sort of promotional angle of your podcast that you can help guests and it gets a lot easier to bring people on the show. Yeah. I love it. This is a great coaching session for me too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, dude, we're both learning. I'm, I'm, yeah, this is great. So are, are there any other like really cool growth levers that you've seen work um, pretty effectively just to kind of continue down that vein? Yeah, so I did another thing which was interesting and I was playing around with SEO on iTunes as well because that's how I managed to get the ranking because initially when you first start, you're always checking the rankings and I'll admit, you know, I was doing it literally daily hourly on my thing because oh, yeah. I was like excited and I'm like, great, you know, I'm moving up and stuff. And for a while, I was sort of sitting like less than like 30, under 30 and so forth and I was like, oh, okay, you know, it's gradually climbing up. But what I did was when I was playing around with some of the keywords on the titles of all the episodes when I first started, it started moving my rankings up and I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. So, I started tweaking the title of my podcast and I started tweaking the way that um, my episodes were actually posted out with the titles as well. And what I got it down to, because initially I was sort of putting a lot of keywords in there and trying to get maybe six or seven keywords to try and rank for my title plus also in episodes. But then what I discovered was, and I read somewhere else that someone was doing this as well, was if you're just putting one keyword or maximum two keywords in the title of your post, they start to rank. So, the reason why I guess I'm ranked for pod, Property Podcast and I'm giving away a secret to my competitors is because I put the name Property Podcast in my title. So, um, every time someone searches for that, that comes up number one on iTunes. And I don't know if it's something that has not been tweaked in, in iTunes algorithm or anything. You know, obviously, if you did that for Google, it wouldn't work. But for iTunes, it still works wonders. And, and that's what I kind of caught on to. So, what I started doing was changing a lot of my back episodes and just by putting in those keywords I want to rank for and they started coming up. And within maybe about a day, once the, uh, the episode name was updated, bang, it was just up the top. I'm like, okay, mm. this sounds like it's working. So, let's try it more. So, I started using, um, you know how, how Google has what they're called suggestive uh keywords mm -hmm. in the bottom of their search bar. So, whenever you type those in, it will say these are X, Y, Z keywords that people are searching on. Mm -hmm. iTunes also has the same thing in their, their search bar as well. So, if you just go in there and start typing, say for example, marketing, it will come up with multiple marketing suggestions as well too. And when you actually see those keywords, you can take those keywords away and plug them into your episodes and then start ranking for them. So, that's a little tip that I, I discovered just by playing and testing and trialing it all out over the period of when I did and, and obviously that worked really, really well because once you start getting found, people start subscribing and bang, you know, it goes up really, really well. Yeah. Uh, another thing I did notice and, and this is what I was trying to track as well and I don't know how accurate this is as well but ratings don't necessarily really help that much in terms of its um, rankings for the episodes. That, that's kind of what I discovered. What was ranking right. and helping push the things up to rank higher was the sub subscriptions to your episode. Mm -hmm. So, it's great to have ra ratings, you know, get people to rating still but it's more of a, I guess, <laughs> a ego slash also, uh, you know, presence thing for, for people to review and say, you know, look, this, this podcast is fantastic, etc. You know, I've got like 205 reviews on my podcast which is fantastic and you know, thanking all my subscribers and all my fans and stuff like that. But I noticed that even if that didn't go up and I, I noticed that when my subscription rates go up, I was getting more downloads. So, I, I kind of drew a correlation thinking that's possibly the way. Now, I don't know the algorithm behind iTunes but from testing and seeing, you know, these results, that's probably another way that I've noticed that has been able to help. So, if you can try and encourage people just to subscribe to your podcast. I think that also helps with um, driving more ranking and also getting more downloads for, 
for iTunes. Yeah. It does. Yeah. yeah. We've, we, seen we, the we've seen the exact same thing. It's yeah. reviews are pretty much useless. I mean, I, as you're, I'm sure, very aware, iTunes recently sort of changed the layout. They changed the categories. They kind of, everything's a little bit different now. Um, mm. But reviews used to help. If you had a lot of reviews, it used to help you get into the section that was there called the what's hot section. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. They, I think they took that away. I don't even think that's in there anymore. So now I think reviews are pretty much useless other than you know for the social proof element and to like people that are just browsing to kind of look and see that you know what are other people saying about this but i don't think it helps at all with um rankings i also don't we also notice that downloads themselves don't necessarily help a ton with rankings it's pretty much the velocity of subscribers Mm -hmm. So new subscribers, if you're getting a bunch of new subscribers every single day, you'll see yourself climb the ranks. Um, You can be getting a hundred thousand downloads a day, but if you're not putting new subscribers onto iTunes for your show, you won't see your show climb. It's very bizarre how the, the ranking algorithms work, but it seems to be at the moment purely focused around how many subscribers you're adding. And that's why we, we try to do a contest or some kind of, giveaway or promotion around subscription or getting new subscribers onto our podcast. So giving away, like we did this last month, giving away Bose headphones, mm-hmm. you're like, Hey, go get these uh, $300 headphones. If you, uh, you know, someone at random and you know, we'll do these on Facebook using ads or even just organic to our groups. So that's something to experiment with is just, you know, figure out could it be your email list as well. Just a perpetual kind of giveaway that promotes subscriptions to your podcast. Yeah, that that's an amazing. And, you know, I subscribe to that offer as well too. So, yeah, yeah it, 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 it does work. <laughs> it does. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, have you tested any any paid strategies to grow your podcast? I have. I've actually been applying a lot of the remarketing strategies that you've been teaching within the course as well too. Mm. And I, I've been seeing more for branding side of things because people constantly are talking about it and say, "Hey, I saw your podcast on you know Google, saw it on Facebook and stuff." And I know that not necessarily do I'm, I'm posting regularly there, but I know that the paid ads are actually going. And, and I've been following what you guys have been been taught by um, I think it was Dennis Yu. Those one dollar mm-hmm. Facebook ads that's yeah. been working really well. A lot of people. And especially my team have been saying, wow, you know, you're really getting, <laughs> it's so cheap and it doesn't cost much, you know, per person. So, what I've been doing is every single guest that we've had on in the past, we just run a, a small little $1 um, campaign to be able to get their show out there, just remarketing out there just for a short period of time. And what we've noticed is that that traffic has been driving them back over to our website and also checking out downloads. So, yes, there has been a, a, a correlation behind those paid campaigns that have been working. I haven't as yet tested out the other things that you guys recommend, like Reddit and so forth. And I, I would like to try that in the future. It's just that I don't know if there's a big market in Australia for that at this point in time because I know Reddit's great in the US, but when it came to Australia, I was trying to find properly Reddit kind of, um, I guess, yeah, those followings there and it just couldn't, couldn't find as many in, in that section. So. Yeah, yeah it, it's, I know it's quite cheap to do it from, from what I've seen, but I don't know if I'll get the return. Um, yeah. What, yeah, the other campaigns I've been doing, and this this isn't necessarily to drive, I guess, um, new subscribers or, or listeners to the podcast, but I've been sending out a regular print advertising offers to past guests and also new potential businesses that would, would come on. And I guess this kind of leads into the monetization strategy of what I've been doing because I've noticed what's happened is that <laughs> for some reason, other podcasts have noticed me actually do this because maybe people do actually read printed letters now, mm-hmm. surprisingly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, they seem to have reached out to me and say, hey, you know, I saw your your printed letter that you sent to X, Y, and Z. And I said, oh, okay, that's interesting. Um, and I, mm-hmm. I knew I didn't send it out to them because I don't usually just send it out to my competitor just for no reason. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, the, I'm noticing that seems to be working and that's probably bringing back more and more people back to the podcast because not only are they listening and, and checking out the podcast, but they're also showing interest in the offer that I'm presenting to them. And this is one of the monetization strategies that I've been applying slowly and gradually and it's been building up really nicely and because we've had a demand behind it, I've actually had to increase the price of this offer. Now, you might be wondering, what, what is this offer that <laughs> he's talking about? Yeah, for, like, for the business? through this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll, I'll break it in a nutshell for you. It, it's essentially taking on a, a spin of the membership site model which I, I've been following a lot of people like... Um, yeah, like James, yourselves, everyone's been looking at recurring models and one of the 
big pain points that initially came out from my podcast and people emailing me was that people were saying, can you recommend me really, really good professionals, whether it be mortgage brokers, buyers agents, real estate agents, uh, yeah, if, and so forth. All the professionals that would be necessarily required to purchase a property or even sell a property or manage a property. And I was constantly getting that pretty regularly every day. And I was like thinking, gosh, you know, I'm happy to refer people to it, but it's just taking a lot of my time because I'm not, you know, getting paid to do this. And I've got no problem with that, but there's got to be a more leverageable and scalable way to do this. So I was having a chat to a few people and they said, hey, why don't you just set up a, like a directory where you can just send it to people there and they can check it out for themselves where these businesses could be listed with the ratings and reviews and also a little bit more details about them and the reasons why they you know, have this X, Y and Z service. And basically, by, by leveraging and turning this into a directory, it allowed me just to be able to forward all these contacts to there so they can find out directly from their customers how they were rather than hearing from me because I, I can be only one recommendation but what happens if you've got 20 or 30 or 100 recommendations on your listing saying that you've done this X, Y and Z directly from their own customers? That's a lot more of a better sell point than it is from me even though I'm only just one person. Mm -hmm. So, that kind of brought an idea thinking, oh great, I could create a, a directory behind that and the way I thought I'd promote it rather than doing the normal online methods to try and email them and ask them to check out my offer and look at the landing page and sign up there, I started sending out these five printed, you know, 12-page uh, uh, sales letters which started getting results. So, roughly I was spending, I mean, just in terms of numbers, I was converting about 6% for the amount that I was spending but I was getting three times return. So, mm. I just thought, oh, okay, let's keep doing it. <laughs> and mm. since that demand's been increasing, I just had to increase the prices from, just had to up about another $100 because I just couldn't meet the demand. <laughs> and wow. that's, I guess it's a good thing to have and then it kind of spun into another idea because I was thinking, I've got limited spots and I've got limited space and that's that's been the key too is I, I want to make sure I don't just add every you know, Tom, Dick and Harry onto the directory that's involved in property. I want to actually have good quality businesses that I can be assured that these people are going to look after my customers and my listeners and so forth. And it kind of dawned on me thinking, why don't I actually see if I can offer like what we call sponsored content? And I've just only recently started doing this and it was actually something I picked up from Alex, Bloom, uh, Alex Bloomberg's Gimlet um, podcast when I was listening to some of the the strategies that they've implemented to, to grow their, I guess, podcast, uh, I don't know if you can say agency, maybe podcast mm -hmm. business, yeah. their platform. And uh, one of the things that they did very, very well was to actually offer sponsored content. Now, I'm not sure if you guys and listeners know what sponsored content is, but I'll, I'll sort of give you a quick sort of summary behind it. Essentially, it's taking, uh, you approach a company who actually is interested in maybe perhaps doing a podcast or writing an editorial or doing something that would be on like a news feed or whatever it is, but actually instead of turning it into a direct marketing ad or whatever it is, you turn it actually into a story which tells about something that's related to the company that's a beneficiary to them. So, give me an example. Um, there's been a lot of, say for example, buyers agents out there and I said to them, look, you know, we can either do a direct ad in a mid-roll for you and we can just do like, you know, maybe 15 second or 30 second ad for you and say, look, the reason why this buyers agent is, is excellent is because they offer X, Y and Z services. If you want a free consultation, visit X, Y and Z for your 45 minute free consultation for $400. Okay, that, that's just a normal ad that we would run and we run that for banks like MeBank, NAB, Commonwealth Bank, etc. in Australia and we've done that very, very successfully. And mind you, you know, they pay very, very well. So, for those kind of ads is great. But then I thought we could actually charge about 10 times more for a sponsored ad where we say, look, you know, to the company, why don't you actually let us help you create this content where we would interview your customer and, and create a story behind it, create a story behind how they got involved with you, what their successes have been, what their journey has been like, whether it be good or bad and, and you know, mm -hmm. tell the story behind why this company is so great subconsciously and not in, in, indirectly and therefore allowing them to be able to um, get in touch with directly as a customer rather than as a business. And that kind of sponsor yeah. content would definitely deliver a lot more ads. And I've actually tried it on a few companies already that have sponsored, you know, a few of the episodes. And man, they're instantly, as soon as the, that goes out, they, they call me and said, hey, I got like 10 leads today. I'm like, wow, okay, it works. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, the first lead paid for itself. It's, so, I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know, I'm going to keep doing this. So, that, that's kind of the strategy I kind of picked up from, from a lot of the sources. And I noticed that like eBay, for example, or Westpac and that stuff like that, they're starting to 
to put these kind of things into place, not necessarily just on printed media or on their websites, but they'll all start starting to consider this inside podcasting. Actually, one of the banks that approached me recently did actually give me a story. It wasn't a sponsored ad, but it was a, um, a, a sort of like an ad with a story in it. And it was it did run for about 30 seconds, but it did tell a little story. And I was thinking, would it be nice if you could have just given me that that client that you, you asked me to read it out for you? And I could just yeah. interview them, let them tell the story. <laughs> It'd be way more effective. I mean, that's, that's more effective. The, yeah, well, that's the bond, you know, with someone actually from a company, you know, and and I, I I love that concept, and I think I understand it. Where it's essentially uh, it's an episode, but you're it's a sponsored content it's, episode. That well, it's native advertising it's native instead advertising. of a podcast. That's all it Spot is. On. So it's Spot a normal on. thing. Yeah. So would that live in like a normal release schedule for you? Like one of the two? yeah. Okay. Yep. So, so instead of say I release a guest for that week, I'd be releasing a two part of say a testimonial from a customer. When I say testimony, it'd be just a story about them, and then mm-hmm. it's kind of a testimony for their company. And it'd say like, you know, this episode is proudly brought to you by X Y Z company, and and it, it just blends in really really well. And people listen to these yeah. very well. Even I do it all the time. Like I've been listening to startup podcasts regularly in your podcast, and you guys are always talking about Ahrefs and all these <laughs> other companies. And it's just pretty normal. Like I, I just I'm so used to it now that. I know exactly you know what's going on. So I think listeners are sorry being attuned to that and it's it's no different nowadays, but they, they do resonate as soon as they hear that though. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love the concept of the business listing too. I, w- I was curious, have you um, read Nathan Lotka's book, um, How to Be a Capitalist Without Any Capital? <laughs> I've heard some controversy behind it. Oh, I yeah. think one, of the, one of the podcasts that you guys had a chat to, one guy just didn't want to reach out to him for some odd reason. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I've wanted to actually pull his book. I just keep forgetting to get it. So it's good that you guys reminded me. I will now check it out because it sounds well, like a, an interesting book. It's good. Well, he does have a whole section in there where he talks a little bit about how he monetizes a podcast. Actually, not a little section. It's, a big chunk big. of the book <laughs> is about how he monetizes yeah. his podcast. Um, but uh, he um, he talks about how he basically brings people on his podcast, gets them to give them his their like business numbers and a whole bunch of insights about their business. And then he takes all the data that they share with him on that and he puts it into like an online database and he charges monthly for people to have access to that online database and people buy access to the database because they they get all these insights um yeah, I don't it, it's it's a ton of data. Basically, he asks very specific questions to like top entrepreneurs or CEOs, and yeah, and essentially has this listing with a bunch of this important data that these people want to know. So there's a subscription fee to access that data. Yeah, and it's all derived is, from his podcast. Yeah. That is genius. Actually, now yeah. I think about it, guys, because there is a company here in Australia called RP Data, and they mm-hmm. collect every single information about every single property. You know, when it's sold, how much it's worth. Yeah. Uh, what it's rented out for, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And I was like thinking, wow, imagine I could own one of those businesses because it's a nice subscription model. You know, people do pay for it and I pay for it every month, you know, to get to get access to it because it's some amazing, valuable data. And I'm like thinking, how could I turn this same thing? Because hmm. if I can get information about how big their business, how many employees, I could potentially think about selling it to, you know, other businesses that might need this information. Exactly. It's an idea, but yeah, gosh, yeah. that's amazing. Good idea. Get the, yeah. bo- get the book. He's got like, <laughs> I don't know, a hundred different strategies in here, but that's a, that's one example to monetize, but also repurpose the content that, you know, you've created on your show. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll dive in more on that strategy in a future episode because we do have Nathan Lotka coming on the show soon. Oh, um, nice, it, nice. I'm looking forward to that one. He told us specifically he wants to be uh, very po- controversial with it. So it'll yeah. be interesting. He said, I'll only come on your show if we can, if I can be divisive and polarizing and we make it, a, um, you know, we make it a crazy hectic episode. And <laughs> we like, said, okay. deal, we can, we can work with that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Nathan just does the talking. You guys just sit there and go, yep. <laughs> Pretty much. I think that's probably what will happen. <laughs> But no, um, like the, the the strategies that he talks about in his book sound similar to you know the business listing type stuff that you're doing. So it might be some really good takeaways that you can uh, you know swipe and deploy from him. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, I'm definitely going to check it out now since you mentioned it. That's amazing. I didn't. Yeah, that, it, that's just a very very unique way to look at it. And uh, yeah, there's lots of opportunity there because there's constantly demand for this type of stuff. Like people pay. I think it's five hundred dollars for a property report here, and very, very well known, you know, websites and, and companies around here. But the people that spend the time getting this information, 
I mean, they, they just spend a lot of time researching and so forth, but like, you know, once it, uh, I guess, gets still down into a specific report, that report mm -hmm. is so leverageable that you can just charge the fee for it. And people do pay, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars regularly oh, yeah. to buy these reports, you know. It's so a time saver. It's, and, and it's, it's a time saver. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It sounds like that you're you're actually leveraging your podcast and tying it back to real estate monetarily as as far as like finding partners for you in real estate as well. Um, is that like a, a pretty big piece of the the revenue that your podcast generates? Is actually uh, working with you know guests that you find on the show on real estate deals? Yeah, yeah, spot on. That that was actually the other monetization strategy that I wanted to um, share with you guys and. That, that idea has been working wonders because what happened was as, as I, I attract so many property investors coming on to, to the podcast and majority of the people and that's pretty much the target market are investors, people who are looking to buy property now, who look people to manage property and so forth. I just thought, wow, you know, we've got a pool of people here who actually do have money. They might have equity sitting in their house. They might have cash sitting in a bank ready to invest into the next deal. And I thought, why don't we just offer to them some of the deals that we're actually currently doing in the background? Because I have lots of partners who actually do have lots of wonderful deals out there that are very, very good in return. Some of them, you know, between 10 to 20 to 30 percent returns. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of finding the people out there who have the right resources to be able to match into that. And I, I kind of become sort of the matchmaker here of putting a deal and a money partner together. And I basically just get a cut through that. But I also do get involved in ensuring that the deal goes through because the last thing I want to happen is after 12 months, the deal falls through and then, you know, people lose their money because it's my reputation on the line. So, I ensure that I'm, I'm very, very heavily involved in that deal. And just yesterday, actually, just came back from Queensland, meeting up with my um, business partner up there who looks for the deals up there. And um, we're just nearly very, very close to completion of the deal because I actually went and had a look at the house, look at the subdivided block of land that we actually did up there. And also the market itself is moving. So just on that deal alone, we were initially going to profit easily six figures from there, like low six figures. And now, since the market's moved and for the same product that we're delivering, we're going to be adding an extra 100K on top of that. So, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of deal for me is, is a no-brainer to be doing to monetize this podcast. Not, not saying in a negative way, you know, it's, it's a great way because we're, we're providing a service. Not only that, we're also bringing people to make money because not only do, do we make money, the money partners also make a nice, you know, income as well too from it because they know that their investment is getting invested rather than just sitting in the bank. Yeah. Oh, it's super smart. And it's kind of interesting because we've been approached by people actually even on our podcast who are property investors to essentially do similar types of deals. Uh, just be, That's the beauty of having a podcast though, right? Like like you have this platform and this influence and you could be the connector. Yeah. So, I mean, you could apply that in so many different ways. People listening, not just real estate, of course. Yeah. I, just, I feel like when it comes to podcasting, so many people look at podcasting and they see okay, I have to record a lot of content and then I make very, very little money off of sponsorships. And that's kind of people's perception of podcasting. Oh, monetizing it. Yeah. Um, yeah. What did I say? Just podcasting, but yeah, yeah making yeah. money with it. Yeah. Yeah. Most people just think it's like, it's like, you know, you, you make sponsorship money and you have to create just tons and tons of content. And I feel like, you know, our, our approach, all of us, all, all three of us, our approach is there's, there's much, much, much more to that, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the reasons that we record the podcast isn't just to make money. It's, you know, there's the networking implications. There's the potential, um, investment partner implications. There's, uh, you know, b essentially free consulting. You know, we've had, we've had people on our show where we've just picked their brains on issues that we have in our own business and got them to just for free, tell us what we should do next in our business. You know, <laughs> kind of doing that for us right now. Is <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You know what I mean? So like, as far Anytime. as like the reasons why also we're all passionate about the topics we talk about. So it's sort of an outlet for our passions as well. But then on the monetization side, you know, it's not just sponsorships. In fact, we do get sponsorship revenue. Now you mentioned Ahrefs. They're one of our sponsors, but, um, you know, for the most part, sponsorship is like the tiniest sliver of the revenue we generate off of this. You know, we figured out how to turn it into recurring um, revenue, just like you've uh, turned yours into recurring revenue. We've, um, you know, we, we figured out how to generate a ton of affiliate revenue off of this. We sell, um, you know, the, the print subscription, which has, you know, various upsells and various offers beyond it as well. And I, I think mm -hmm. the more people that we can show that, look, podcasting is something you should be paying attention to. I think, uh, the people that, that get it stand to 
really have some massive gains in their business. But I, I just think it's, it's, yeah. it's hard to get people to get it still. <laughs> no, I totally on, agree. People, and I was going to say, we should just keep it between <laughs> ourselves. Yeah, I was going to say, just keep it between ourselves for now because, you know, otherwise we go. <laughs> we don't need to release this, you know. Yeah. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. Uh, what was, I think you had one other, uh, well, I think I, I know you do, but you mentioned the Q&As that you do uh, as part of your weekly thing, like Q&A episode, and that ties into a monetization. Well, that was kind of the native advertising concept he was talking about, right? Well, no. It, I that's, think it's, yeah, it's, this is a slightly different, and I'll, I have I to gotcha. give you guys okay. credit for this, because you guys are the ones who actually gave me this idea. So Ooh. I took it one step further. So yeah, so basically, it's affiliate marketing, you know, in a nutshell. That, that's really the concept behind it. And what I've done is I've struck a few deals with a few property experts, and what I usually do is just get them to sort of tell a story, you know, answer some questions from people. We get a lot of case studies coming in and people are asking about, you know, I'm in, you know, I'm 10, I'm 25 years old and I, I currently have like $10,000 saved up. I want to jump into property. What's the best way to go about it? That's an example of the Q&A. And then you've got people who are retired and got like, you know, 200 million, 200 thousand dollars in, in in a deposit ready to buy the next properties and you know got two million dollar portfolio blah 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 and i thought why don't we just bring these people in as experts to help answer these questions and at the same time they were actually wanted and they did approach me because you know from out of blue it's just like hey you know i'd love to come back onto your podcast because i know when i came onto the show i got a lot of um, leads coming from that way and i said hey you know why don't we try and work out a deal and Every time a lead gets referred to you, I'll take a percentage cut out of that and, you know, for whatever you guys do, we'll just do it on a monthly basis. Once a month, you guys hop on, answer these questions, tell stories about some of your clients, share some topical information that's on at this point in time and, you know, whatever happens, we can put a call to, call to action with a specific code and a number and they simply just drive those leads to them and then they basically work and follow up with them and if it's successful then I get basically a commission out of that. It's it's the same concept as affiliate marketing. The only difference is that the I guess the revenue share is percentage wise it's smaller but it's a greater amount because we're dealing with thousands of dollars rather than say you know a couple hundred dollars here and there for a course. So mm -hmm. it's it's been a win win for me for them and for me as well because not only am I helping the listeners as well because the listeners love to find out specifically about topical information which I wasn't able to offer in my stories because that was something that I intentionally kept away from actually answering any specific things about the market because with content like that it does change very very quickly and six months down the track it won't be relevant whereas every single piece of story content I've created is evergreen so anyone can come back 10 years down the track and still be very much applicable. So I kind of allowed for that to happen because it was pretty much driven by listener demand because I had many people email me and say, hey, can you start you know, sharing a little bit about specific details about property development? And actually, that's funny because that's how I, I actually went to a joint venture to start another podcast on property development because people were actually demanding for more of those kind of things. And I'm actually even going to be start telling my story on the property development journey just like how you know, so Alex, Alex Bloomberg on, on, on startup started sharing his startup journey. So, yeah. I guess that's that's kind of spun off a few other things that I'm doing as projects for next year. That's cool. Yeah, that's the, <laughs> these are so cool strategies, man. I love how, you, I mean, like Matt was saying earlier, it's just a lateral way of thinking is don't think so down the pipe like what everyone thinks they should be doing like sponsorships, but just like that, just create the story based around like a service that you could be an affiliate of, but in a way you can arrange your own deal with them, their deal structure, and that could be super profitable. And the idea is like, you really just have to do maybe a handful of these things, not even, maybe just one, maybe you just want to pay for your production costs and all mm -hmm. that stuff. Totally. A lot of folks, that's a great way to start is just pick one, do it really well, and, and extend from there and just kind of like flow with whatever your audience wants next. Yep, totally. And I think the, the really great thing about something like this is a lot more leverageable than actually just trying to get sponsorships in because when I thought about it further with sponsorships, like say for example, if a bank approached me and said, look, you know, I want to actually get a 30 second ad, most of the time they actually want to buy all uh, ad spots inside the podcast. So that means that I've blocked out a whole month just for that bank and therefore I can't actually earn more revenue, mm -hmm. you know. They, they, they pay a substantial amount, which is fantastic, but then you're limited on how much they pay. And the only way to scale that up is to either have more podcasts, which I, I, I'm planning to do, or, you know, really to just 
add more sponsorships to that ad spot and like when you have too many then it sounds like as though you're just promoting you know sponsors and that's not what, where I intentionally headed so I had to think of other ways and this has been phenomenal ways to be able to do it it's a lot more leverageable you know leads can constantly be coming in and plus you you know take your action off the pie because you know someone's going to be making money anyway you might as well try and help them and, and take a piece of the action as well yeah 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 it's, it's kind of a fine line we all have to toe between being too overly promotional and um you know still providing good content so that people want to come back you know we want mm -hmm. we want good user experience listener experience but we also you know we're all in this because we need to make a living as well you know that's we are passionate about it but we need all we all need to generate an income <laughs> yeah absolutely you know that's how how we create these amazing podcasts without that we can't you know deliver the best quality that we, that we can so yeah I, I totally agree that's the thing i think people just probably would like to know okay what is actually like if you're transparent about what you do and how your business operates people really genuinely understand because you're delivering great value you're helping them on a, a really, really great way, but also at the same time, everyone is actually getting paid for what they're best at doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you just make it a win-win, make it good value all the way through. No one should care. Everyone's yeah. winning in that. Yep. Um, so let's, I think we're, uh, yeah, this is another, this is a great show. I mean, this is like one of those episodes where we don't want to cut you off, but we're just like, yeah, <laughs> we're getting a little long now. And I think you, you're running out of time and you're in too. Um, I wanted to all ask you a happy, question. Happy to, to share a little bit more. Sure. Oh, well, is there one? I don't want to cut you off. You have another good strategy that uh, that you want to share. Is there anything else before we kind of wrap things up? Uh, I, I guess the only thing that I, I probably would say in terms of where I've been in this business at this point in time is building those relationships is so, so important, as you've all said, because the networking aspect is something that's not measurable directly. It's not something that is tangible and saying, you know, this person brought in X amount of dollars and so forth. So those relationships that you build can come back in, in multitude and magnitude in the future. And, and that's what I've noticed. Like I've had a number of podcast guests said to me, hey, you know, would you like to share and interview this guy for, you know, X, Y, Z? And I would never have ever connected with those people before because if it wasn't for these connections I've built, they would not have referred to me. And some of those people that have come onto the podcast and shared their stories have been phenomenal. And um, I think that's, that's a key component for just thinking outside of the square, not necessarily thinking, okay, podcasting is just only to make money through sponsorship, but you can also build some amazing quality relationships. And not only that, you learn from all these wonderful, great people because for someone who's only like, I know like people only $100 million property development deals and you know have millions and millions of dollars of property for them to spend an hour to share their life and to share their story with me you know i'm so grateful for that because at the same time it's their hour that they could be investing to make more money you know whatever it is or spending with their time so to actually have that um, opportunity to be able to do that i'm just very very grateful to see that happen in my life but not only that for, for listeners to also you know enjoy that as well too so i think that's how i've been able to be very very happy to give back to society because i've just been so so, so grateful that these people have spent their quality time with me to share their knowledge in return i want to do exactly the same thing for all my listeners as well yeah absolutely actually what what you just said actually um made me think of another question i want to ask you real quick when you do have guests on your show what what do you do to stay connected with them? Because that's something mm -hmm. I, I feel like we're, we're we're pretty good at it, but there are definitely some guests that slip through the cracks where we just kind of lose communication after they've been on the show. So I'm um, I'm curious if you have any sort of process that you use or any sort of tools or or anything that you do to make sure that anybody that you connect with on the show you keep that connection. Yeah, it's it's a really good good point, and I'm I'm I have to admit I'm not the best at following up. You know that's why I rely very heavily on systems because without systems I just can't function. I, I just there's so much to do. That's the thing I can jump from this and that. But I think the biggest thing that's helped with me is is just sending them like a letter. You know, I, I, because what that's what I've been doing with my clients is that I've been sending them a monthly newsletter, and they're they're the contacts and the guests that I've had on the show in the past because they've been the ones who have actually you know, been able to. Um, get business listings with me and stuff and, and through that means because I communicate with a marketing newsletter it keeps them in contact and then they reach out to me like as soon as they receive my newsletter next minute I get a call from them <laughs> and they go hey Toro mm -hmm. you know what's happening x y and z so th I think that's that's been my my way of following up because 
if, if I had to actually pick up the phone and regularly call them, I, I think I'd struggle with that, to be honest. So I don't really yeah. have a specific way that I do it, but in many ways, I think the, the newsletters I send by post, you know, which I send out quite a number of them on a monthly basis, helps me keep in contact in front of mine so that they end up calling me instead. Gotcha. So are, do, you, yeah. do you actually like hand write letters to them or are you sending them the newsletter that you're sending, you know, everybody who's on the newsletter? Yeah, it's the newsletter. And then from time to time, because I've got them in my system, I ask them for the birth dates, I ask them all that kind of stuff. I do send out handwritten notes like thank you cards or birthday cards or, or just something nice, you know, just to keep in contact with them. So at least on a minimum, mm -hmm. once a year, I do send out something to celebrate their birthday. Oh, that's, that's smart. Yeah, that's, we should we should start collecting birthdays. <laughs> add it we, to the list. I'm sure you you noticed. <laughs> yeah, I, we, I, I thought you I thought you guys I thought you guys do already. I that's what I, I no not, we don't for the birthdays. Yeah, I, we no we ask we ask your address and we ask your shirt size. Ah yes, that's right. Because yeah, I yeah. do I do remember filling those in. But no, I I, I intentionally started asking for birthdays because I knew that one way or another I can know about their anniversary find out a little bit more about them in that sense and then just send out something nice. You know, like the first thing I do, and I, this is probably a lot of people get like surprised when they receive this because as soon as they sign up to be a customer and, and go on a business listing or a sponsorship package, the first thing I do in my system is I send out a hamper to them, a full hamper that has amazing food in it. And as soon as they receive it, the next day or on that same day when they receive it, they usually call me or text me and say, mm. this is a surprise. I've never ever received this from somebody like, you know, doing this. So that kind of gives them a wow already and then through that I try you know, adding little things sprinkling throughout so there'll be a Christmas kind of card that goes out during Christmas, Easter time. Whenever I can find a festivity time of the year, I'll send something out to them. That's really how I keep in contact with them in a systemized awesome. way. I like that a lot. I, like I think that, yeah. I think Joe and I should make some like cheesy Christmas cards with both of us wearing like Christmas sweaters <laughs> right. and like you know make it look like a family photo, but it's a picture of me and Joe and just send them to everybody. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't put it past us. <laughs> That's something we that. should. Yeah, no, we really should. I, I just love the cyclical promotions that you're engineering. Essentially, is like it's holidays, it's birthdays, it's it's any other big event maybe that you see them on social media. Like we had Steve Sims on our podcast, and he's oh, like yes. the master at this. He and is, yes. Yeah, you're doing this. Uh, we actually asked the same question because Matt. Yeah, the question you asked Tyrone just now was exactly what was in my head too. I was like, I thought he'd stay in contact. Yeah. And we asked uh, Jordan Harpinger. He was on the show recently. It's not released yet. How he stays in contact or how he keeps track of everyone. And um, I think he said he uses contactually yeah, yeah, as a did. CRM or a, whatever a management system online. So maybe look into that if you want to organize people that way. I think that's how we're probably going to do that. But then also swipe awesome. what you just gave us here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. I, I, I do want to mention though, I mean, this comes naturally to me when setting up these things because I'm, I'm strong in systems and, and yeah. processes and workflows and those kind of things. And that, that's, I guess, what I've always done when I've been at, at um, yeah, my jobs and so forth. But the other thing, because I used to be a real estate agent as well, that also was a skill that I picked up because when I was managing so many clients with real estate, after as soon as we sold their property, we'd send them a hamper, but also too, on the, at least a minimum, twice a year, we'd make sure we make a call just to see how their new house is and so forth. Because what happens is, is that that continuous contact over the seven years, they keep at the front of mind thinking, okay, I bought from this guy, I'll come back to him in a few years time to sell with him if I'm looking to sell. And that, mm -hmm. that's kind of the methodology or the, the philosophy that I picked up from real estate in the past. And I just thought, why not just apply? Because I already know how to do it, it's not hard. It just got to systemize it because once you're sending out to hundreds of people, you obviously right. can't do that all yourself. So, um, yeah, that's why I've got checklists in place and, you know, like I've got automations already in place to follow these things through and um, that's what triggers me. Like with, with my, so for example, my lead follow-up system, I've got triggers to make sure I just send a text message to this person who hasn't replied back after two or three days. I just copy mm -hmm. and paste it from my email and then text it out to them. You know, things like that. Those are little secrets <laughs> I should be revealing on this podcast but yeah, things like that make it easy for me because otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> you're not forgetting these things. It's awesome, man. No, I, I know your systems guy. The first time you and I chatted, actually, when you joined, I remember you were like, you basically said that. And now I can see why and like how effective you are because they're doing a lot. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I don't think you even have a big team, right? Like it's very tiny it's slash you. Yeah. No, it, it can be a... A good thing and also a bad thing as well because you end up just getting into the systems and you just end up not doing enough marketing, which is what I, I'm trying to balance the two at the moment. So, where can, uh, you know, we're wrapping up here. Where can folks go listen to your podcast, check out what you have online and everything we've been talking about here? 
Awesome. So you guys can go and visit to propertyinveststory.com and uh, over there you guys can get a free report if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about um, how to actually generate an extra 15% a year on year return from property. Simply just uh, property investor is the word property investor with a Y dot com at the end. And uh, yeah, feel free to just yeah, download stuff there. You can also reach out to me on there as well too. And uh, once you subscribe, you can also just send me an email. And if you feel like you want to ask more questions, feel free to do so as well. So happy to share more tips and strategies. And uh, yeah, I definitely recommend if anyone wants to find out more about the Pod Hack Masterclass, Pod Hacker Masterclass, definitely check it out because I definitely can recommend it highly because I benefit so much from it. And um, I'm in there as well to, to share information. So thank you so much, guys. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Tyrone. Uh, you you laid out like a whole master class here, so we'll let you go. I know you're you got to get going, so we'll we'll uh, touch base soon, man. Appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thanks so much, Matt. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, man. Bye bye. Hey, thanks so much for tuning into that episode. I hope you loved it as much as we loved recording it. Now, before we wrap this up completely, I want to give a quick shout out to our uh, our supporters of the show. These are some companies that have really helped us and have supported the show. And we just like to give a big thank you to them. And they also are offering some cool free gifts for you as the listener. So, uh, number one supporter podcast magazine, podcast magazine, the preeminent publication covering podcasts, podcast culture, and the podcasts that fans love. It's launching in January of 2020 prior to launch. You could grab a free lifetime subscription over at podcast Com. That is a free subscription, a free lifetime subscription to Podcast Magazine, where they are talking about everything podcasting, podcast culture, the podcasters you love, behind the scenes of podcasts, their ranking and reviewing podcasts. And guess what? Joe and I are actually going to be regular contributors to Podcast Magazine. So if you want to hear more of our insights around podcasting and the shows that we're listening to and some insider tips about what's going on behind the scenes of our show, we're actually going to be one of the featured experts inside Podcast Magazine. So if you love podcasts, if you're a podcaster, or if you just want to stay on top of what's going on in the growing medium, subscribe now because you can get a free lifetime subscription until it launches. So make sure you do this early. So once again, go to podcastmagazine.com. Free subscription to this magazine. Go do it. Get on that now. Another supporter that we really, really want to thank is Easy Webinar. Now, this is the webinar platform that we tend to use when we run webinars. If you go to easywebinar.com slash hustle, you can actually try Easy Webinar for free right now. And what I love about Easy Webinar personally is that it's got both the live options, so you can just go live with a webinar like you would normally, but it's also got automated webinars where you can make a webinar feel like it's live, but it's happening on a recurring basis. Then they have what's called, you know, hybrid webinars where portions of it are live, but then it goes to a pre recorded and then they do encore webinars. I mean, they've got pretty much every feature you can ever want from a webinar. Now, you probably know that webinars convert better than any other marketing tool, but if you thought you know webinars, Easy Webinar is gonna surprise you. So with live, automated, uh, all these different functions of webinars, you're gonna be using the best onboarding customer platform. Uh, you're gonna be able to create automated courses. You're gonna run automated sales funnels. So much cool stuff that you can do with Easy Webinar. It is our preferred choice of platform for webinars. So make sure you check out Easy Webinar. You can get it for free right now. Uh, get a trial of it over at easywebinar.com slash hustle. And check out our episode with Casey Zeman, uh, the founder of Easy Webinar, where we dive into a lot more cool stuff that you can do with webinars. So check it out again, easywebinar.com slash hustle uh, to get a free trial. Go to podcastmagazine.com to get a free lifetime subscription. Both amazing products, both products that we use, we're subscribed to and we support and uh, can't thank them enough for also supporting our show. So go check those out. Uh, we appreciate you and thanks for tuning in to Hustle and Flowchart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of the Hustle and Flowchart podcast. Before taking the time to listen, we want to give you something a little bit special. Every single episode that we do, we actually have somebody on our team take notes. We basically have a Cliff's Notes version of every episode where you can go and find all of the tips and tactics that they laid out, all of the resources that they laid out. All the good stuff from this episode, we actually have a nice, simple notes version that you can find on our website. So go to evergreenprofits.com, find this episode that you just listened to, and uh, give us your email address, and we'll send you the notes.